Um, hello and welcome to the weekly seminar series hosted by the Centre for European Legal Studies at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I am Emilia Lehnerte, Assistant Professor um, at the Law Faculty. I, I am very happy to chair today's um, event um, and I am thrilled to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Alexander Horn. Um, Alexander wears many hats um, and has a truly unique experience and uh, knowledge to discuss today's topic, which is Parliament and Brexit, some challenges for constitutional, uh, for political constitutionalism. Um, Mr. Horn um, is a senior barrister and a counsel in Hackett and Depth. Um, he has served for almost two decades um, as a legal advisor in Parliament, and uh, is a, he was a legal advisor to the House of Lords Committee, Euro, uh, European Union uh, Committee, and was part of its um, uh, senior leadership team. Um, he is currently uh, a special advisor to the International Agreements Committee at the House of Lords, which he also helped to um, establish. He has written extensively on the law and parliament um, and is currently a visiting professor at uh, Durham University. Um, Mr. Alexander Horn uh, is a strong voice in the debate um, on the role of parliament scrutiny um, in the context of Brexit, but also uh, beyond uh, and particularly international treaty scrutiny. And so we uh, are very lucky to have him here today with us to share some of his um, experience and, and knowledge. Um, his talk today is based uh, on a larger piece uh, of research, which uh, will be coming uh, in a form of a book chapter next year in the new edition of Parliaments and Law, which he is editing uh, together with Ben Yon. So I invite everyone to, 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 to keep an eye on, on, uh, on the, uh, the publication. Uh, before I give a floor to Alexander, I would like to express um, a thank you to uh, my sales colleague, Professor Catherine Bernard, for a wonderful idea to invite uh, Alexander um, to this event, and also to the faculty officers, um, Daniel Bates and Felicity Eves Ray, for arranging the details um, of the talk. So, without further delay, um, the floor is yours, uh, Alexander. Good afternoon and, and thank you very much. Um, before I start, I too would like to thank uh, Catherine Bernard for the very kind invitation and Cambridge University and the uh, Centre for European Law uh, for hosting uh, and Amelia, uh, you, you also for uh, both chairing and the very kind uh, introduction uh, this afternoon. Um, as you say, my background is uh, that uh, I worked as a barrister in Parliament uh, between 2003 and 2021. Uh, that culminated me, me acting as legal advisor to the European Union Committee uh, and also the International Agreements Committee uh, during the period of Brexit. Um, although I should say I'm speaking in a personal capacity today. Now, the aim of this uh, webinar, um, well, I'm hoping that we will today explore the role of Parliament during the Brexit process and in particular, um, three things. First, consider the scrutiny of the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement. Uh, secondly, address some of the issues which arose during the passage of the Internal Market Act. Uh, and finally, uh, address some questions about what happens when scrutiny uh, isn't enough. And I hope we'll have enough time left at the end uh, for some Q&A afterwards well, I'd be happy to address any questions you have either about the talk or more generally uh, about Brexit. So kicking off and, and about the title, um, well, I suppose it's first um, proper for me to, to just explain what I mean by political constitutionalism. And in simple terms, uh, when I use the phrase, what I'm addressing is a system where the government is held to account through political means via political institutions. So in our case, the UK Parliament. And this can be contrasted with legal constitutionalism, which is again, and putting things very simply, based on the idea that the exercise of government power can be held to account by law and the courts 
and where the operation of that power can be checked through judicial oversight and a respect for rights. Now, during the past five years, the cases of Miller I, Miller II, and Whiteman v. Secretary of State for exiting the EU demonstrated the importance of legal constitutionalism. Yet I would argue in reality, these were Pyrrhic victories. And ultimately it was the failure of parliament to decide on a particular course of action, which resulted in the victory of what I might describe as the vote leave faction and the Brexit arrangements, which we now see slowly unraveling today. In theory, following the first Miller judgment and after the 27 general election in particular, Parliament found itself in a strong position to influence proceedings. It benefited from the following conditions. The need for a parliamentary authority to trigger Article 50. A government lacking a majority between 2017 and 2019. A promise that Parliament would receive the same information that was provided to the European Parliament under Article 218 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. The promise of a meaningful vote on the final deal and the need for the government to pass legislation to enact any deals agreed with the European Union in domestic law. Yet somehow, in spite of each of these points, Parliament wasted its opportunities and failed to press home its advantages. So perhaps I might kick off with what happened immediately after the judgment in Miller 1 and the passage of the European Union Notification of Withdrawal Bill. Now, the first issue with this was that the bill that was introduced following the Miller judgment was very tightly worded. It contained only two clauses, and essentially it gave the Prime Minister the power to notify the European Council of the, Europe uh, of the UK's intention to withdraw from the European Union under the terms of Article 50 of the Treaty on the European Union. And that was it. The result of this was that members of Parliament found it difficult to bring proposed amendments within the scope of the bill. Erskine May, the Bible of parliamentary procedure, indicates that any amendments or new clause or schedule proposed to a bill must be within its scope. And the scope of a bill represents the reasonable limits of its collective purposes as defined by its existing clauses and schedules. So you can see that we have an issue there. Now, in spite of this, several amendments were the subject of divisions or votes. However, even the small number of points which were put forward on issues like citizens' rights and a meaningful vote on the future relationship with the EU, was successfully resisted by the government in the House of Commons. It argued this was not the right legislative vehicle to discuss these issues. The government did at least concede the principle of a vote in Parliament before any withdrawal agreement was ratified, but nothing further was achieved. The bill was passed within two months of its first reading and became law on the 16th of March, 2017. On the 28th of March 2017, the Prime Minister signed a letter which set the formal Article 50 process in train. So I'm now going to turn to the next instance, which is the general election, the negotiation of the withdrawal agreement and the passage of the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. So as we all know, in April 2017, Theresa May took the momentous decision to hold a general election. She said she called the snap election to secure a majority for her Brexit negotiations. And she argued that, and I quote, the country is coming together, but Westminster is not. In recent weeks, Labour have threatened to vote against the final agreement we reach with the European Union. The Liberal Democrats have said they want to grind the business of government to a standstill. The SNP say they will vote against the legislation that formally repeals Britain's membership of the European Union and unelected members of the House of Lords have vowed to fight us every step of the way. Our opponents believe the government's majority is so small that our resolve will weaken and that they can force us to change course. The style of the election campaign was unedifying, and we may remember the notorious headline in the Daily Mail, Crush the Saboteurs. Opinion polls prior to the campaign had consistently shown big leads for the Conservatives over Labour. However, in the event May underperformed during the campaign, and when the results were announced on the 9th of June, it became clear she'd lost 13 seats and her majority in Parliament. As a result, she became dependent on a supply and confidence deal with the DUP. Having triggered Article 50, the clock was, as Michel Barnier never hesitated to remind us, ticking towards the UK's exit from the European Union. <laughs> 
and a withdrawal agreement had to be agreed if the UK was to leave the EU with a deal. In my view, whatever your overall views on Brexit, it was at this stage of proceedings that things began to go badly wrong. May had triggered Article 50 without a clear plan, and this was soon to become a significant problem. Initially, Parliament was distracted by the promise of a great repeal bill, which eventually became the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018. This was subject to great scrutiny and significant amendment. Yet the negotiation of the withdrawal agreement received nothing like the scrutiny of the EU withdrawal bill. The promise that the UK Parliament would receive the same information as the European Parliament proved illusory. The real negotiations about Brexit were happening behind the scenes as the UK and EU negotiated over a financial settlement, citizens rights, governance, and most crucially, the arrangements for Northern Ireland. At the beginning, these negotiations were fairly transparent and chapters were agreed on citizens rights and other matters. However, as we all recall, nothing was agreed until everything had been agreed. And once Northern Ireland and governance issues became the main sticking point, transparency went out of the window. David Frost has recently pinpointed the agreement of the joint report in December 2017 as the moment when the UK had, and again I quote, drifted into accepting the EU's view that the only way to ensure no hard border, including any physical infrastructure or related checks or controls on the island of Ireland was for the laws on either side of the Irish border to be identical. The issue with the joint report is agreed is it tried to face in two competing political directions, a position which would never fly when it was translated into legal text. Moreover, as a result of this agreement, the UK effectively conceded that a legally watertight solution to the border question had to be included in the withdrawal agreement rather than postponed to the future relationship negotiations. The position in Parliament was perilous for the Prime Minister. In practice, Parliament contained several factions, Perhaps the largest was concerned that the UK would end up leaving the EU without a deal, and it focused its efforts on trying to design mechanisms to avoid that happening. A smaller faction, which I'll dub the hard Brexit or vote leave faction for the sake of convenience, was more concerned that Theresa May would agree to something they described as Brexit in name only. Once she'd failed to win the general election, May's support in her own party was not assured. And the question of the Northern Ireland backstop, which had been agreed by Theresa May following the adoption of the joint report, became increasingly toxic for the hard Brexit faction, which refused to accept that the agreement might become a permanent solution. By the time the proposed withdrawal agreement was published and subject to votes on the 15th of January, 12th of March and 29th of March 2019, it was apparent that the deal negotiated by May did not have the support of the House of Commons. Moreover, the government had failed to identify whether there was any form of Brexit which could garner a majority in the House of Commons. When a series of innovative, in indicative votes were held on the 27th of March and 1st of April, it became apparent that the opposition was not willing to coalesce around any of the available options, be that a customs union, membership of the single market, or a second referendum. And by the late spring, the situation had become untenable. So on the 24th of May 2019, Theresa May announced she would resign, triggering a contest for the leadership of the Conservative Party, which, as we all know, was won by the current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Following Johnson's succession, any thoughts of compromise disappeared. Recalcitrant Conservative MPs had the whip removed. But the hard Brexit faction appeared to have won the day. During this period, it appeared that all political and intellectual capital including that expended passing the Cooper Letwin bill and the Ben bill, was spent delaying the UK's exit from the European Union and preventing a no deal Brexit. But as for Brexit itself, it seemed to me that the best was always the enemy of the good. No one seemed to wish to take responsibility for accepting what might be described as the least worst option. Whilst all of this was happening, after the second Miller judgment, Johnson himself used the time to renegotiate the part of the deal that the hard Brexit faction found most objectionable, the backstop. Following talks with Leo Varadkar, Johnson announced that the backstop would be replaced with a new protocol on Northern Ireland. 
Although the eventual compromise that was achieved now appears to be unloved and potentially unworkable, Johnson achieved the one thing that he prioritized, a democratic override, which meant that it was possible to exit the majority of the obligations in the protocol following a vote in the Northern Ireland Assembly. This allowed him to present his renegotiation as a triumph, even though he clearly misled parliamentarians as to its effect. While this was clearly disreputable, I remain somewhat surprised that the EU didn't spot the potential problems this would cause in the long run. Even at the time, I found it hard to believe the UK would stick to an agreement in circumstances where the Prime Minister was essentially dishonest about its impact, and when his primary ambition appeared to be to insert a provision to allow it to be terminated. As we all know, Johnson eventually succeeded in forcing a second Brexit-related general election. This rewarded him with a substantial 80-seat majority. All of the high-profile backbench MPs who'd left the Conservative and Labour Party to fight against Brexit, including Dominic Grieve, David Gork, Chuck Ramuna, and Luciana Berger, lost their seats. I'm going to turn now to events after the 2019 election, and in particular, scrutiny of the withdrawal agreement and the trade and cooperation agreement. Now, I can speak fairly briefly on the question of scrutiny of both of these on the basis that it was at best rudimentary and at worst non-existent. Despite the initial promise of a meaningful vote, once the government had a large majority, it not only resiled from this commitment, it also bypassed the very modest treaty scrutiny requirements under the Constitutional Reform and Governance Act 2010 by disapplying the relevant provisions. The implementing legislation for each agreement was eventually fast-tracked, and given the complexity of both agreements, it would probably be fair to suggest that the majority of MPs would have had no idea what they were voting for. The European Union Withdrawal Agreement Bill was introduced to Parliament on the 19th of December 2019 and gained royal assent on the 23rd of January 2020, just nine days before the UK left the European Union. Meanwhile, the European Union Future Relationship Bill passed through both Houses of Parliament in a single day, the 30th of December 2020. Both episodes highlighted the fact that the UK Parliament was not geared to scrutinising international agreements. The statutory regime under Craig does not promote information sharing, nor does it require Parliament to consent to treaties prior to ratification. While Parliament's now established a new International Agreements Committee in the House of Lords to scrutinise new treaties, in a recent report on its working practices, it's recommended that the statutory regime be overhauled to address these concerns. Now, there must be an irony in the fact that MPs spent so many months considering the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, which was in reality mainly a device to retain most existing EU law as UK law, and yet found so little time to scrutinise the novel arrangements which would frame the UK's future relationship with the EU. I should note that the House of Lords European Union Committee produced comprehensive reports on each agreement. Nonetheless, there was almost no time to consider the report on the final version of the withdrawal agreement. And the report on the TCA only appeared after the primary legislation implementing the agreement had been passed. There was some further irony in the fact that the EU, so often labelled remote and unaccountable, allowed its parliament many additional months to scrutinise the TCA postponing ratification until April 2021. So finally, I promised some reflections on the passage of the Internal Market Bill. On the 8th of September 2020, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Brandon Lewis MP, made a statement in response to an urgent question, which asked him to, I quote, make a statement on the UK's commitment to its legal obligations under the Northern Ireland Protocol. Lewis indicated that a proposed UK internal market bill would be tabled the following day. The bill was designed to make provision in connection with the internal market for goods and services in the UK. During the course of his speech, as is well known, Mr Lewis admitted that the bill would breach international law in a very specific and limited way. The reason for this was that it sought to introduce powers which would allow ministers, amongst other things, to disapply obligations to apply the EU Customs Code to Northern Ireland, contrary to the provisions agreed in the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol. Additional measures, originally contained within the bill, 
would have allowed UK ministers to apply state aid law according to UK rather than the EU's interpretation, potentially disapplying or modifying the effect of Article 10 of the protocol. The government also acknowledged that it was taking the power to disapply the EU law concept of direct effect, which was required by Article 4 of the withdrawal agreement in certain very tightly defined circumstances. The introduction of these provisions was hugely contentious. Both the Treasury Solicitor and subsequently the Advocate General resigned shortly after it was introduced. On the 10th of September 2020, the government unusually published its legal position on the proposed legislation. The statement appeared to originate from the Attorney General, Suella Braverman, although her name did not appear on the face of the document. The published paper accepted the need to discharge treaty obligations in good faith, but it argued that, I quote, it's important to remember the fundamental principle of parliamentary sovereignty. It went on to contend that as a matter of domestic law, the UK Parliament can pass legislation which is in breach of the UK's treaty obligations and the Parliament would not be acting unconstitutionally in enacting such legislation. The paper went on to claim that due to the UK's dualist legal system, treaty obligations only became binding to the extent they're enshrined in domestic legislation. Now, this was a remarkable proposition, which received a robust response. The House of Lords European Union Committee, which was often cautious on overtly political matters, concluded unanimously that the assertion was clearly wrong in law. The committee explained that the correct view is that treaties are binding in law on the international plane. In the Miller judgment, the Supreme Court made plain that the dualist theory is based on a clear distinction between international and domestic law. At paragraph 55 of the judgment, the court observed the following. International law and domestic law operates in independent spheres. The prerogative power to make treaties depends on two related propositions. The first is that treaties between sovereign states have effect in international law and are not governed by the domestic law of any state. As Lord Kingsdown expressed it in the case of Secretary of State and Council of India, 1859, treaties are governed by other laws than those which municipal courts administer. The second proposition is that although they're binding on the UK in international law, treaties are not part of UK law and give rise to no legal rights or obligations in domestic law. Now, accordingly, it followed that while the principle of parliamentary sovereignty allowed Parliament to legislate in a manner contrary to international obligations, such legislation is only operation in the domestic sphere and does not cure the breach at international law. Now, this all seemed quite straightforward, but there was also the issue of constitutionality and the House of Lords Constitution Committee was also highly critical. It stated that setting out explicitly to break international law in this way is without precedent. It jeopardizes international obligations the UK recently ratified, undermines domestic law, and is contrary to the rule of law. The government has not provided a satisfactory justification for this course of action, and we do not consider that there can be one. Owing to the government majority in the House of Commons, any modest amendments to the bill could be secured. However, by the time the bill reached the House of Lords, the row had escalated significantly. Notably, Lord Howard QC, the former leader of the Conservative Party and a prominent supporter of Brexit, observed in debates that, and I quote, I want the UK to be an independent sovereign state that holds its head up high in the world, that keeps its word, that upholds the rule of law and that honours its treaty obligations. I want it to be an independent sovereign state that is a beacon unto the nations. I do not want it to be an independent sovereign state that chooses as one of the first assertions of that sovereignty to break its word, to break the law, and to renege on a treaty that it signed barely a year ago. Eventually, these proposals were dropped, and it appeared that Parliament had won a small victory in support of the rule of law. Yet that was now a year ago. And today, with a sense of deja vu, we face a government which is again threatening to tear up some of the obligations under the protocol, this time apparently seeking to go rather further than the very limited breaches proposed in the Internal Market Bill. It will be telling how far Parliament can act as a break on these proposals.
So to conclude, the incredible events of the 2017-19 parliamentary session are likely to be analysed in great detail for many years to come. When considering what happened, it's important to remember the fundamental challenge facing the government, and in particular Theresa May, prior to the first meaningful vote. It was clear that a cross-party coalition was needed to approve the withdrawal agreement. However, if the Prime Minister worked too closely with the opposition, her own party was likely to challenge her leadership. In relation to the official opposition, their strategy was to use their relative strength to weaken the Prime Minister, perhaps hoping that it might lead to a general election, rather than to offer the government of the day the support it needed to deliver a pragmatic form of Brexit. The crisis in the Labour Party during this period did not help matters. Many of their top performers were on the back benches, and it's striking that most of the high profile political interventions in this period came from backbenchers and committee chairs, such as Yvette Cooper, Hilary Benn, as well as the former Conservative Dominic Grieve, supported by a rather partisan speaker. The incidents I've described today do not show Parliament in a particularly positive light, given that there was no majority in the 2017-19 Parliament for the type of Brexit that was eventually achieved by the Johnson government after the 2019 election. It's hard to pin down the precise moment when the hard Brexit vote leave faction won the political argument. Nonetheless, the opportunities presented by each of the Miller judgments were squandered by those who opposed Brexit. On the first occasion, that was unsurprising, given the nature of the EU Notification of Withdrawal Act, which presented opponents with few opportunities for effective amendment. But the behaviour of parliamentarians after the Miller II judgment was less understandable. While it was evident that there was no desire to coalesce around Jeremy Corbyn, who refused to offer a coherent position on Brexit, it's less plain why the opponents of Brexit were unable to agree on whether they wished to opt for a second referendum perhaps predicated on the acceptance of the deal negotiated by Theresa May, or whether they felt it safer to opt for a softer Brexit involving EEA membership or a customs union with the EU. As it was, whenever there was a vote on these issues, they fell between two stools and allowed those promoting what they saw as a clean Brexit to prevail. While the early prorogation of Parliament was seen by many as a constitutional outrage, which highlighted Parliament's limited powers. It can also be seen as a masterstroke by members of the Vote Leave team advising the Prime Minister. The combination of an attempt to thwart the Prime Minister leaving without a deal, combined with the failure to find an agreed way forward, allowed Johnson to present his proposed Brexit deal to the exhausted public with the message, get Brexit done. By contrast, the Labour Party manifesto promised to rip up the Brexit deal negotiate a new one within three months, and put it to a public vote with the option to remain. This attempt to appeal to every side of the debate was clearly a fantasy. In some ways, the intervention of the courts allowed the government to paint the picture that so-called Remainers were trying to use whatever processes they could, whether parliamentary or judicial, to stop the government leaving the European Union. The novelty of the fact that both Miller judgments controversially challenged prerogative powers probably did not assist with that interpretation. My final conclusion, however, is that Brexit also demonstrated the limits of both political constitutionalism and parliamentary scrutiny. Scrutiny by Parliament can take many forms. It might occur on the floor of the House, through a forensic question posed by an opposition spokesperson, Alternatively, scrutiny might be delivered through a detailed report by a select committee following months of evidence gathering. It's meant to ensure transparency, accountability, and better policy making. And up to a point it does. While I've been critical of the information provided by the government during the Brexit process, there was considerable scrutiny by parliamentary committees. Members of parliament were also provided with significant briefing by the House of Commons Library. But mere scrutiny without the power to drive change can be ineffectual. And when it comes to the time for decisions, it's far from clear that all of this scrutiny ultimately pays off, particularly in circumstances where the government of the day has a large majority in the Commons. Whenever we face a political crisis, it's inevitable that there are calls for more rigorous scrutiny. Yet members of Parliament might be wise to reflect on the fact that, whilst this sounds like a sensible answer 
sometimes scrutiny alone only takes you so far. Many problems are identified by Parliament. Far fewer are successfully resolved. Scrutiny only works if the government is prepared to listen to and heed honest criticism. It is not in and of itself a panacea to ensure effective government and decision making. Sometimes you also need to introduce robust measures so that you can not only identify bad decisions, but block them as well. Thus, I think if there's to be any sort of Brexit dividend for Parliament, I would suggest that MPs look at three practical options to increase accountability. First, they should insist on the need for parliamentary consent to the ratification of important international agreements. The Commons Political and Constitutional Affairs Committee is currently conducting an inquiry into the issue of treaty scrutiny, and I hope we may see some developments there. Second, I think the departmental select committees in the House of Commons could do more to align their scrutiny work with the legislative process. They should try to ensure that they can use their policy expertise to support amendments, preclude misguided government action, or even identify opportunities for positive legislative change. Amendments with cross-party support, backed by a committee and underpinned by an evidence-based report, are like to have greater impact than those only promoted by a single opposition party. Finally, I'd argue that MPs might want to consider revisiting the idea of a House Business Committee to take responsibility for the agenda in the Commons. This was recommended by the Right Review in 2009, and the Coalition Government of 2010 promised to introduce such a mechanism, but never delivered. Originally, the idea was that while the committee would guarantee the government had the time to get its legislative programme through, it would also improve the scheduling of business to ensure more effective scrutiny of legislation. Unfortunately, the experience of the House taking control of its own business during the Brexit saga appears to be viewed as a dangerous aberration by the current government. Nonetheless, if the House of Commons had better control of its own business, I think we would have far stronger checks and balances. Thank you very much. And I'll conclude there. And uh, perhaps we can uh, see whether there are any questions either on the talk or, as I say, on, on, on Brexit uh, more generally, since I think lots of these issues uh, probably are now back in play uh, in terms of what the government is currently doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Brexit is such a convoluted uh, saga and thank you very much for um, so clearly setting um, the, the pieces of the puzzle for us um, um, in order. Thank you very much. I invite uh, the participants to ask questions in the Q&A box. Uh, that would be helpful, uh, not in the chat, in the Q&A. And I will perhaps maybe ask uh, an introductory question to, 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 uh, to get. Um, I found it very interesting that the, the three options of reforms kind of directions that you were mentioning. Uh, and in terms of the first one, um, the parliamentary consent perhaps uh, requirement, I, that, is, that is a very um, interesting uh, question. And in, you know, we, we do see now a debate on how the parliamentary scrutiny should be um, enhanced perhaps through the reforms of the possum by rule. I just wonder, in the context um, of UK entering an, an unprecedented situation where uh, there will need to be sort of a very fast track uh, revision of almost, I believe, 800 international agreements, uh, how in, the, in, those, in, in this unprecedented times would the reforms of the Possum by Rule, uh, which direction they should take, if I understand, it, your suggestion would be to increase parliamentary consent. Yes, I mean, very briefly, just to address uh, the point. So over the Brexit period, um, uh, the International Agreements Committee and its predecessors and the EU Committee looked at the UK rolling over uh, the agreements that you, you mentioned. And as you said, originally, we thought that there would be an extraordinary number of agreements. The Financial Times reported that there were over 750 agreements. When we eventually looked into this, um, it emerged that there were far fewer because some of these were older agreements uh, and so forth. But nonetheless, um, I think that there were trade agreements with over 60 countries. 
um, and there were many other agreements uh, that had to be uh, looked at and, and we introduced a new system there that, that the House of Lords would report on those agreements and that there would occasionally be debates on those that were drawn to the special attention of the House. But now looking forward, all of the agreements that the UK enters into are new agreements. In relation to those old agreements, they were at least rolling over agreements that the UK had already been participating in as part of its membership of the EU. So the absence of consent and very significant scrutiny, I think, was less troubling. Looking forward, we're talking about major trade deals with countries like Australia and New Zealand that have far reaching effects, joining a brand new trading block in uh, CTP, C, well, anyway, the, the, the Trans Pacific Partnership, um, uh, and possibly entering into, you know, lots of other different types of agreements, not all of which are related to trade. I think. Looking at that, it, it, it's very telling that we've moved from a scenario where there was a lot of scrutiny that went on in the European Parliament to a system where our own domestic setup has only really scrutiny in the House of Lords and no, um, no consent mechanism other than uh, where the treaty requires domestic legislation. And even where the treaty requires domestic legislation, obviously, by the, by the time you get to that stage, it's already been signed and agreed. So the only thing you can do is, is essentially say that you don't want to sign up to it at all. And I think what I found on the International Agreements Committee is that there's much more interest in getting involved earlier in the process. And then when you have a significant agreement, uh, much more interest in making sure that Parliament has a say in whether or not uh, the UK wishes to sign up to that. And also a need, um, which I didn't mention in the talk, but I think is important to reference now to involve um, the devolved governments as well, because, um, you know, obviously Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales may well have different interests uh, in relation to issues around trade and agriculture and all of these issues. And so there needs to be some way to, to factor in what happens when the UK is signing up to uh, agreements which affect their interests, particularly when those are devolved competences. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, also a question uh, probably related more to the current events from Gilles Lucien. Um, I will perhaps read the question uh, so thank that uh, everyone can hear. Um, thank you very much for this really interesting talk. And my question relates to the current EU-UK trade relationship troubles, especially concerning fisheries. I wonder if the fact that both sides seem to be resorting to unilateral retaliation rather than a dialogue through the joint committee uh, reduces the ability of the parliament to scrutinize the enforcement of the withdrawal agreement and the TCA, right? This sort of more retaliation um, method. Yes, I, I, that's a very interesting question. I, I think I'd sort of subdivide it um, in, in some respects. In terms of the scrutiny aspect, we've actually found even scrutinizing what happens in the joint committee troubling um, because essentially you get a readout after meetings, but you don't necessarily get everything in advance. It's difficult to know what's going on anyway. So the starting point is that you don't have a, an enormous amount of transparency full stop. Um, I think most people would say that if these uh, conflicts end up using the dispute resolution mechanisms, this at least is the way that the agreement is meant to work. Um, and, and this should lead to some degree of pragmatism. At the moment, there seems to be suggestions of, of sort of tit for tat um, uh, exchanges. A lot of these I don't think are that well informed um, because there are immediate talks of trade wars. And when you look down the withdrawal agreement, the way that all of this thing is meant to be handled is um, much slower. There's meant to be consultation in the joint committee. There's meant to be uh, then reference to arbitration and proportionate retaliation, if at all. Um, the TCA has very complicated um, uh, provisions in relation to this, even on fisheries. Um, and I think uh, there have been some useful charts that have been put together that shows how those work in practice. But the point is that they're meant to be reasonably slow, reasonably proportionate. Um, at the moment, we seem to have reports, uh, mainly from politicians, uh, making threats, and, and that doesn't seem the most constructive way to, to engage with that. But, but, but also, 
uh, as you said, uh, as, as the um, as, as the questioner said, not the most transparent either, because it's then not clear which of the threats are actually even realistic in the short term, let alone um, what the effect of that would be vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the two agreements. I hope that's, uh, that answers the, the question sort of. I think that transparency in general is, is the sort of almost one of the main dilemmas, right, for parliamentary scrutiny. So then if you... Um... I think that's right, but it's also the way in which this is being handled. I mean, let's be frank, you know, finding out on Twitter uh, a dialogue between David Frost and his counterparts in France, it, it's not the way to get detailed information. Um, you know, it's not the way to convey detailed information. Um, and it leads, I think, to some degree of misapprehension about what's going on behind the scenes as well, um, simply because that's then translated by the newspapers into their particular interpretation of things. And I think people often forget that those newspapers are then read on both sides of the channel and um, those interpretations can lead to escalation in terms of the wars of words that you hear between the parties. Yes. Um, thank you very much. And let's move to a question from Craig Prescott. Uh, Parliament had little time to scrutinize the withdrawal agreement and TCA, but at that point, what could Parliament do? If they amend the implementing legislation, they could end up breaching international law. That's the criticism leveled at the government with the internal market bill. The government should be required to seek a negotiating mandate from Parliament and then seek approval for its stance as negotiations go through. Perhaps the irony is that this more like uh, that this more like the EU's approach. Um, well, I agree with Craig's final point entirely, and I'd separate out the two negotiations. Um, during the speech, I made the point that Parliament was promised uh, the same information as the European Parliament uh, in relation to the withdrawal agreement. Now, this never happened, um, and you could see a complete breakdown in terms of the transparency between the first bits with citizens' rights, where they're actually publishing on a monthly basis traffic light documents showing which bits had been agreed, which bits were still under discussion, which bits, you know, were amber. Uh, that was really helpful. It mean, meant that you could see precisely what was under discussion, what the issues were, whether there was anything that Parliament might suggest to uh, move matters along, whether or not the parties were behaving reasonably. When it got to the stuff about um, governance and, and uh, you know, the involvement of the CJU and things and what the scheme would be about that, and certainly the Northern Irish stuff, it all went completely silent. And we had the impression when we visited uh, the European par Parliament, the European Council, that um, people there were still getting briefings about what was going on. Um, and at our side, you were more likely to find out from an article by Tony Connolly uh, what was going on behind the scenes than you were from our own parliamentarians. And that was a terrible state of affairs. And I think that the withdrawal agreement could have been handled better had, had there been more transparency there. With the TCA, Craig's right in terms of the, 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 the timing, but I'd still make the point that the European Parliament insisted on three months to scrutinize the agreement, whereas our parliament agreed it in one day. Um, now, there is an argument to say that this agreement had been made and therefore there was probably little that could be done but it's worth noting that the legal scrubbing of the agreement was still going on at this stage there were still minor tweaks that you could have made to it if they needed need, needed making obviously you couldn't have revised the the the, the, the thing that had been signed um, but nonetheless i mean the european parliament at least took the view that this was something worth looking at in three different committees for several months Whereas, you know, we just passed the legislation and then said to committees, well, there's nothing left here to do, but you can look at it now, even though you've already endorsed it in domestic law and we're going to ratify it and we're provisionally applying it anyway. And I think that would be my criticism there, that in essence, if you look at what we're doing to agree um, a trade agreement with New Zealand, there's months and months of consultation and you know, the farmers are able to say, well, we don't want the import of lamb or we don't want this or this is a problem with the deal. Yet we've agreed so much more with the EU, you know, one of the allegedly the most progressive um, trade deals in the world, um, you know, as a third country, that is. And yet, A, most people don't know what it does. 
and B, there was none of that consultation. Um, that you know, none of that worked, and I think that's where I would say the problem lied, in 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 regard to that agreement. Yeah, there is no um, sort of eight year time frame to negotiate uh, these agreements like EU had with CETA, for example. Um, well, so, exactly. Yeah, it's it's a it's a different um, different situation. We have a question from Professor Catherine Bernard. Uh, wish she could be asking it uh, um, uh, live, but I will just read it perhaps. Um, this was fascinating, thank you so much. Had the Labour Party agreed to customs union earlier in the process, would that have withstood a hard Brexit Tory party winning an election? Or would we be uh, where we are now, uh, refighting earlier fights? That's a very interesting question, and I think I, I, I'm going to duck the second half of it slightly because obviously the answer the answer really is, is is no. If we'd had that general election and there was a there was a hard Brexit Conservative Party, they wouldn't have have agreed the custom with main, maintaining a customs union. However, if we think back to the period of the indicative votes, I think Kenneth Clark's proposal for the customs union was the one that came the nearest to. Um, having a majority in Parliament. And I think the issue when we got to the end of um, those negotiations was really that had Parliament itself come behind one of those proposals fully and endorsed it as a compromise, I think that there was a chance that you then might have even seen a vote of confidence in the Johnson government. Because you have to remember at that stage in proceedings, Johnson had just withdrawn the whip from a very large number of his MPs. Um, he'd taken over the leadership and behaved very ruthlessly. Um, he didn't really have the support of the majority of Parliament. The problem was that Parliament refused to actually endorse uh, anything. And I think part of that was because they refused to endorse Jeremy Corbyn. It was the, it was the Travis and the Labour Party that, that really caused this problem because, um, you know, had there been somebody else somebody convincing behind whom they could have coalesced and said what we actually want is an exit with a customs union. I question whether you necessarily would have had um, the, uh, Boris would have had the ability to have this take, you know, essentially take back control type election where he was saying get Brexit done because these people are trying to thwart us. I think he would have been in a very different position where we may have had um, a, a different type of general election or even a period where Parliament itself um, took forward the, uh, the agreement behind a different personality. And I think it was very unlucky for us that we essentially had a situation where, where the Labour Party was in meltdown. Uh, at that period, we had people leaving the Labour Party, we had the allegations of anti-Semitism uh, and all of these other issues that meant that um, whatever the majority in Parliament might have wanted to do, there was no one behind which they could actually say, this person will, 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 will take the lead. Thank you. Um, I will jump to the question from Dora Robinson, who thanks you for such an interesting talk. Um, you say that the efficacy of parliamentary scrutiny is limited because the government doesn't necessarily listen. Your solutions to this focus on external accountability mechanisms in Parliament. I wonder if you think that there should also be more focus on and reform of internal accountability mechanisms within the executive to improve its listening capabilities, and if so, what they might be. I think um, I, I struggle slightly with that in the sense that I think that it's it's the executive which is meant to be accountable to, to, to parliament the, the executive is accountable also to the electorate obviously when that, whenever there is an election uh, and the executive does hold consultations when it doesn't have a settled view but i think where the executive does have a settled view um that becomes more difficult i mean i appreciate the point that there are arguments that that cabinet government itself is a constraint uh, on the Prime Minister and that perhaps we haven't seen enough of that. Um, and that certainly with the current government, the personalities um, almost seem to be um, insufficiently large to hold the Prime Minister uh, 
to, to account. Um, and we saw that, I suppose, with the reshuffles recently where, you know, people thought that a number of the senior officers of state um, might be reshuffled. And in fact, the um, foreign secretary was, and there was speculation around the home secretary. There are not uh, in the current government, I suppose, quite the number of large personalities that you might have seen uh, previously. And I think that makes holding the prime minister in particular to account more difficult. I've also written elsewhere about the issues around David Frost. I think it's troubling that we end up with a very senior minister dealing with all of our relations with the EU in the House of Lords. And this is not because I think the House of Lords does a bad job. I think actually of the two houses, it probably does the more considered scrutiny. It probably has the more effective members because of their backgrounds uh, and so forth. But I think it's simply inconceivable that you can have a long term situation where you have a man you know, tweeting away about international relations from the position of being in charge of relations with the European Union, who is not accountable to the elected house. Um, uh, uh, and I think that, that we ought to reflect on that to some extent as to whether or not there are other mechanisms that, that, that might be put in place to make that work better. Um, but of course, he will be in cabinet. And so he is answerable to his, his cabinet colleagues. Um, uh, uh, and we simply don't know precisely how far they do or don't coalesce behind uh, what he's currently doing. Thank you very much. We have um, a question that is very interesting and you'll probably have to summarize your, your book chapter by Lucia de Oliveira. Uh, do you think that the Brexit experience presented new nuances to the well-established differences between political and legal constitutionalism? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I started off with a very basic description of the of, of the two, and I do think that there were nuances uh, in in terms of both. I think that the talk I gave today demonstrated the limits of political constitutionalism. Um, broadly speaking, I've always thought that political constitutionalism is 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 a good thing and is embodied in Parliament in a lot of different ways. I've often used the example uh, of the Joint Committee on Human Rights as a, as a, as a sort of standard setting uh, mechanism in Parliament. The Constitution Committee, likewise, I think does very good work in that regard um, of holding the government to account and amending legislation and doing these sorts of things. In terms of legal constitutionalism, I, I'm slightly more troubled, as I hinted at in the speech. I think that in one way you saw uh, a court that was troubled by what was happening and stepped in to intervene. So you can see that it was successful as a mechanism to stop the government overreaching. I think both the judgments themselves um, have troubling issues about them. The second one in particular, if I'm completely honest, I'm not entirely sure that the court grappled with all of the issues um, there's a point around Article 9 of the Bill of Rights that I won't dwell on now, given the time, but um, that I don't think it dealt with properly. And I would have been much happier to see uh, a situation in relation to that judgment where they took a, an approach nearer to the Jackson versus the Attorney General case, where they said that if Parliament had been prorogued in such a way that was unacceptable, that they would have stepped in, but without necessarily doing what they did because I think now you find that that judgment in Miller 2 is subject to criticism by quite a number of academics um, who are supporting the government's revisions of things like judicial review on the basis that the courts overstepped the bounds. So I think yes there's a lot of nuance there in terms of legal constitutionalism and I think it presents us with quite a lot of difficulties going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, we are slightly running out of time, not uh, yet, but I will. Um, I would like to read a question which reminds us that uh, parliamentary scrutiny is not only about uh, trade, and um, it's also about other areas of life. And uh, in this particular question, it relates to human rights. Um, uh, Dalia Rojmo is asking many thanks for your presentation. I wanted to ask about the ratification of the Istanbul Convention. The UK <laughs> Parliament has made efforts for the convention to be ratified, but there have so far been no results. Is this simply not a priority for the government or are there other reasons for the delay in ratification which the government has put before the House of Lords? 
Thanks a lot in advance. Thank you. Well, that's a very interesting question and one which I've written about previously and would refer uh, to a piece that I did for UK and a changing Europe on the 10th anniversary of the Istanbul Convention, which I hope is easily findable online. Um, but to answer the question directly, um, I think that the non-ratification is very problematic. We signed the agreement more than 10 years ago. Um, I think the reason that it hasn't been uh, ratified is entirely down to the Home Office. Um, it is a problem that they have with an equal treatment related provision, which could impact on uh, migrants who uh, don't have a legal reason to be in the UK. And I think that it's entirely down to the Home Office um, presenting problems in relation to this, that this hasn't happened yet. The Home Office tell us they have a pilot scheme in which they will try to address their concerns. However, um, they also floated uh, in front of the House of Lords uh, the suggestion of a reservation in relation to that provision of the convention. Um, either way, I would definitely encourage people to, to, to look at that because I think it's not only a very important convention and one which has an awful lot of salience uh, this year in relation to the concerns that have been expressed about violence against women, um, but also demonstrates a real problem that Parliament's role uh, has essentially ended um, in terms of it having any leverage on, on the government. It, it has really done as much as it can. It's passed a private members uh, bill, uh, which is now an act, which requires the government to report to Parliament on a yearly basis to say what it's doing to ratify this convention. The government produces reports. I leave it to, to, to viewers to read those reports and see whether or not they think that they're in any way convincing. Um, but my worry is that we'll be in the same position next year and this convention still won't have been ratified. And the ratification seems to be um, to also have a geographical and geopolitical dimension to it. So UK seems to be slightly a case apart, um, hopefully. This will be corrected uh, soon. We are running out of time and unfortunately we have to respect the, uh, the time limits and uh, will not be able to answer the last question. Um, but um, thank you very much for such a wonderful and fascinating talk and the amount of questions indicates that uh, people are um, highly interested in the constitutional aspects um, of Brexit and beyond and uh, Thank you very much. And on behalf of the uh, Center for the European Legal Studies, um, we appreciate your time and your insights. Um, thank you. I I'd just like to, to, to thank you for, for having me uh, and also to thank the audience for such interesting and engaged questions. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be here today. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. And we look forward to our uh, next week's seminar and we invite everyone to attend as well. So uh, we are closing the event. Thank you very much to everyone.